Okay, putting pride aside this morning, let's get into the Word of God. Uh, you can turn to Mark chapter 2 if you have your Bibles or electronic device this morning. I don't know about you, but I've really enjoyed this series in Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark. It's, uh, whenever we teach something here, of course, some of you that know, you have to put a lot of time in studying. In fact, last night I posted a uh, an iceberg. I love that picture because what it does is it shows the ocean, just a little part of the iceberg above, but then it shows the massive amount of iceberg underneath the water that we don't ever see. And when you study the Word of God, that's what you don't see is the time that it takes to prepare. And, and I'm thankful last week that Jeff Trott shared a great message with everybody here, and I know that he took time to study. And again, I know that God did His work because His Word doesn't return void. And so I'm thankful for anybody that preaches, teaches, because again, there is a lot of time that goes into us. And this is what I'm really enjoying is taking again, because years ago I did a, a study in the book of Mark, and back then we didn't have hard drives, and it was actually in written form, and I've lost some of my notes somewhere. So it's made me go back and actually rewrite this, this study that we're looking into. And so I'm hoping that you're enjoying it, too. I know we're only in chapter 2, but again, I've become one of these preachers that believe that we have to go through Scripture, through Scripture, through verse for verse, because I think if we don't, we miss a lot. So, and even today's message, I was just getting so much out of it as we looked at it. And again, today we're going to see where Mark definitely points out why it's important that we know the Old Testament and reread the Old Testament. Again, for some reason in the world that we're living in today, uh, in fact, a big church in North Carolina, a pretty prominent leader has made it clear that the Old Testament is no longer for us. Uh, I'm here to say that that's a lie from the pit. Because the truth of the matter is the Old Testament has always looked forward to Jesus Christ. And without knowing the old and seeing what God was doing in the old, in the old covenant, you're not going to see Jesus or the new covenant. And so Mark is going to take us back into the Old Testament today with this idea of the Sabbath. And so uh, the message is the Sabbath, but I want to give you a title of who Jesus is. And so far in this series, in just the two chapters that we've covered, we've seen Jesus identified in, in different ways. And the first way is this, Jesus, the God slash man. So we've seen that Jesus has been introduced to us as God and man. Jesus, we've also seen introduced to us as Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We've also seen him introduced as the Lord. We've seen him introduced as the coming one who is mightier than I. And that was spoken by John the Baptist when he said that Jesus must increase and I must decrease. We've seen that he is one who has declared that he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit so far in verse chapters 1 and chapter 2. We see that God spoke in identifying him as the one and only beloved son in whom he's well pleased. We also seen that he's been introduced as the preacher of the gospel. And that was the reason why he came is to preach the truth of God. It was one of the most important reasons. We see also that he's been called the Son of Man. And again, it has not been identified since the book of Daniel as the Son of Man. We see that Jesus has been one that has been identified that where demons fear him and acknowledge who he is, the Holy One of God. We also see that he's been identified as one who has power over everything that has went wrong in the world as far as diseases, death, sin, demons, temptation, and sin. And today we're going to look at another identity that is given to Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. And that is the Lord of the Sabbath. The Lord of the Sabbath. Now, I want to ask you a couple questions. What do you think of, and you don't have to answer out loud this morning, when I say the word Sabbath, what do you think of? Go ahead. You can shout them out. Why not? A day of rest. What else do you think? What's that? Sunday? Yeah. 
What else do you think? Day of worship? God's day? Hey, Dan, good to see you. What else? Okay. Some of you might be thinking, really, some of you Bible scholars might be thinking, ah, Friday evening to Saturday evening. Right? Anybody thinking that? There might be some of you here that thinks, ah, yeah, it's a day to cease from work. But what I want you to really gather today is this, is that the Sabbath, and I'm going to bring this out in the Old Testament, was actually made and given for us as a mercy to be able to have a time of rest, to cease from work. And we know that God actually instituted the Sabbath himself in the uh, the, the creation. It says that he did all those things in six days, and the seventh day he rested. And that word Sabbath there, and the word Sabbath that we know, actually means to cease from activity, to rest. Now, how many of you know that God doesn't need to slumber? He doesn't slumber or sleep, Scripture tells us. God is not like us. He does not get tired. He doesn't slumber or sleep. But again, God made the Sabbath for man. And Sabbath is also a time that we should take and we should glorify God and honor him. And again, in this day that Jesus is in, Sabbath happened. And I think I brought this out two weeks ago on Friday evening. When the sun set until Saturday evening when the sun set. But what I didn't bring out to you two weeks ago was how many laws had been added on about the Sabbath by the Pharisees and scribes. In fact, uh, as we look, one of the first books that I actually purchased in Bible school was a book about that thick. And it was called The Life and Times of Jesus Christ the Messiah. A great book. I recommend it. In fact, I, I, I actually went to go purchase a new one yesterday because I've lent mine out to somebody that I don't know who I lent it out to. If you have it, I would like to have it returned to me. But the thing is, is my copy back then was about this thick, and I noticed now they've narrowed it down a little bit. And my copy was so small, I don't know if I could read it today anyway. But in that book... It brought out so many great points of Jesus Christ, but also the customs and the days that he lived in. And one thing that they brought out really powerful in that book is is the what the Pharisees did to the Sabbath. Now, I want you to listen to as I read in Exodus 31, 13 through 17, because this is God's intent on the Sabbath. To the people of God in this day. In Exodus 31, 13 through 17, it says this. You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. That you may know that I am Lord, has sanctified you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it's holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it. That soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is Sabbath. I shall solemn rest, holy to the Lord. And whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And one thing I want you to recognize here is this, that God lays this out to the children of Israel, what Sabbath is. And again, in our day, in the New Testament church, it was the seventh day to where the church came and met and gathered. Okay, does anybody here keep the Sabbath? Five, sun, sunset on Saturday to sunset on, uh, I mean, sunset Friday to sunset Saturday? Okay, I, I didn't think so. But when I grew up, my parents took the Sabbath pretty, pretty thorough. My, my brothers and sisters will tell you that when we went to church on Sunday, you went to church 
And you went to prayer meeting and we never missed a prayer meeting. None of us kids missed prayer meeting. From It didn't matter how young you were, you were going to go to prayer and, and you were going to either bow your head or kneel down and pray. And so we always did that. And back then, a lot of the church did that. Uh, it's not like today where we have prayer meeting and you have four or five people show up. And and so uh, we would attend church. And, and I remember at 10, 11 years old, my father had given us notebooks and we would take notes of the sermon that was being preached that morning. And then what we always do is we'd come home and it didn't matter what Sunday. I remember when Missy and I started dating, she might have thought this was weird, but it was a good thing to us. Every Sunday, my mom cooked a turkey dinner. She would put it in the oven before we went to church, set the timer on the oven, and when you came home, it was like you walked into a little bit of heaven every Sunday morning. I still like turkey dinner today. But then after that, we rested. We rested. And again, uh, I was taught from a very young age to have a, a good work ethic. Uh, many people that went by our house, there was either huge wood piles out front or big concrete piles out front that needed to be broken up with sledgehammers and placed along the bank of St. Mary's River that we lived on. But on Sunday, all work ceased. We'd eat dinner, and then we took a nap. And you took a nap until about 5 o'clock, and then you got up, and you put your church clothes back on, and, and you went to church Sunday night. But you made the prayer meeting at 5.30 before the 6 o'clock service. And then we'd come home, and you'd pretty much come home from service. Back then, it was about 8.30. I know I'm a long-winded preacher, but they were a lot longer-winded back then. And we'd get home about 8.30, 9 o'clock, and it was bedtime. That was what our Sundays looked like. And I'll tell you, I missed the naps. I, I wish that my days, my Sundays, still instituted that nap. But one thing I want you to recognize here is this, is that Sabbath was given for man. It was a mercy to where man would not have to labor seven days, but it was also a time to recognize God, to glorify Him, to honor Him. So we've got that set in place. But what happened was this, and I have to give you this background because you won't understand where we're going in Mark chapter 2 if I don't give it to you. But like I said, the Pharisees throughout the time that God instituted the Sabbath, and we, I want you to notice something there in that part that we read in Exodus 31. The only thing that man was to sustain from was work. Cease from work. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I don't really see certain things in my house as I do them as work. I see work as uh, what I do at the Marine City Water Plant for F&V operations. That's what I see as work. And, and so, but what the Pharisees did is they added all these heavy burdens on the people that day to almost where it was crushing overwhelming again 24 chapters were instituted just for the sabbath in their laws 24 chapters can you imagine that 24 chapters of what you could do and what you couldn't do and jesus again this was a button that was a hot button to the pharisees this is something that they, again, not that they instituted it, but they made sure that it was going to be kept. And they made laws and they went above what God had said to just ensnare and overburden the people of the day. In fact, in Matthew 15, 3, Jesus says this. He answered and said, why do you break the commandments of God for the sakes of your tradition? So here he's telling the Pharisees, listen, why are you breaking what God instituted with your tradition? And how many of you know that tradition is not a bad thing? 
But when tradition trumps mercy, it's legalism. When tradition trumps and is more important than people, it's, 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 I want to use the word, it's damning. It's, it's, it, it causes a burden to be placed on someone that was never meant to be placed. And in Matthew 15, 8 through 9, we see Jesus speaking these words. This people honors me, honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So Jesus, in this time, he's constantly going up against the Pharisees. Because what they were instituting was not life, but death. It was religion by works and not relationship. And we have to be careful that we do not fall into the same rut. We have to be careful that we are not, what Jesus says in Matthew 15, a people that honors me with their lips alone, but their hearts are far from me. What does that look like in our lives? Listen, folks, I've said this before. You better be careful if you put a fish sticker on your car. Because what you're doing is you're identifying yourself as a Christian. And you better better play it out. Because everybody's looking at you. What does this look like? Or today, do we even declare that we're Christians or born again? Because I I realized in the day we're living in, not many people even want to proclaim that. They don't want to identify as that. And let me tell you something that is true. Jesus Christ, he fought against anything that brought death. Any religious system that brought death. I said this two weeks ago. The sticker that I see on cars coexist drives me crazy because we are not called to coexist with false religions. We are to stand firm in what we know is the truth. Jesus did the same thing. Listen, there's churches out there that are big churches that will tell you, and I can show you the video as proof, so this is not something I'm just making up or heard, that will tell you that Allah is the same God that Abraham served In the Old Testament, it's a lie. There is no coexistence with Allah for Christians. It is damning. It is false. So we stand firm against it. You don't see Jesus cuddling up to the Pharisees trying to win them over. Oh, we kind of believe the same thing. No, you never see Jesus doing that. And Jesus is the one that says, love your enemy. That's severe. This is why in the New Testament that we're told that if somebody preaches a different Jesus, not to even acknowledge them. Listen, some of you are going to have to answer for that. Some of you embrace groups out there right now because you... Don't use the discernment that the Holy Spirit gives you to see what they stand for. You realize most big churches in the United States now are falling away from the truth of God. Again, Missy said to me yesterday, somebody that I actually looked up to in youth ministry, a man, young man named Josh Harris. In fact, John Simmons can tell you, In our youth group at Salt River Christian Church, we actually went through Josh Harris's book about dating. And some people say, well, there was legalism there. And you know what? I I still look back today and I said, no, I, I don't see it. Because what I hear of most Christian dating today is this, is guys and girls in the church sleeping around with one another. Guys and girls having several people that they have slept with. And that's not God. That's called fornication. God has a standard. But I see this week, Josh Harris has declared that not only is him and his wife separating, but he is no longer a Christian. And he is embracing things that God says he hates. Listen, we are living in a time, and listen, I'm seeing a 
of falling away like I've never seen before. And I don't know about you, but it's got my attention. I have to have discernment because God has placed me here as a teaching pastor, but also as a shepherd along with other shepherds to protect our flock, to be able to preach the truth. And listen, in the days to come, truth is not going to be readily accepted. There's some people that would hear that statement that I made that Jesus does not cuddle up to the Muslims or other false religions, and they would be offended about that in churches that promote the name Christian today. All you have to do is see his interaction with the Pharisees to understand Jesus did not tolerate false religion. He wouldn't. And therefore, we can't either. Whether it be in the quotes of Christian under legalism or Christian preaching a different Jesus. Listen, most churches, most teachers that you need, if you listen to the Internet, there's a lot of great teachers on the Internet. I listen to a couple, and the thing is, is I always go back, and I will go back to their church or to their ministry, and I see what their statement of faith says. And you would be shocked sometimes what you'll find in statement of faith, that Jesus was just a man when he was here on the earth. It's a lie. He was God and man. That is preaching a different Jesus. There's some of these big ministries you can go on their web pages. And again, some of you would say, well, I really don't care what's on their statement of faith. Hey, remember, we were told don't acknowledge them. Don't bring them into their into your home. That's what we we're told. And think about that. Jesus, who says, love your enemies. Pray for those that deceitfully use you. Listen, go and look and see what's on their statement of faith. I can tell you some of the biggest churches out there, they'll tell you that Jesus was just a man and he did miracles on this earth. And that's why we should be able to do miracles today because we're just men just like him. And one day we're going to be God just like him. Shocking. Listen, church, we're living in the day you've got to start doing your homework. You can't just rely on me to do everything for you. You have to make sure what you're reading is correct. I I brought up a few months ago about the Jesus calling. None of you here, if you're still using that, I, I would I would really get before God because the Jesus calling is writing scripture. The things that are written in there, they're writing first first hand from Jesus himself. And these are things that Jesus never said. They might pull things out. Listen, again, Jesus is a, a, a God. He, Jesus is the Son of God who came here and he declared in Matthew, we're going to see today, where, listen, anybody that's heavy, has burdens, come to me and I'll give you rest. Those are his words. But when you take those words and you write in the first person and you change and add things, it's exactly what Revelation says we shouldn't do. And the people that do it, it says, will be damned. We're living in a day to where there's a great falling away. And church, our eyes need to be open to it. We need to be doing our homework. You have the ability to do it on a device called a smartphone. Yesterday at work, one of my guys who is 75 years old that works there, a guy that is dear to me, Marty, he received his first smartphone ever. And he didn't know how to find his number on it when he got it got mailed to him through corporate. And I was there and I was helping him set it up. And he couldn't believe you could get your email on a handheld device. He couldn't believe that there was a level. This guy's a woodworker. He couldn't believe there was a level on it and how accurate it was. He couldn't believe that you could go on YouTube. And he says, I've got a computer in my hand that's better than my computer at home. Listen, we have the ability to check out. And not only using the discernment the Holy Spirit gives us, but the ability to find out who we're following, what we're reading, what we're listening to. You have that ability, and I encourage you, church, to do that. Don't be deceived. So getting back to our text here, we see what happened was the Pharisees had added on all these 
rules. And I want to give you some of these rules that you'll just find unbelievable that they could not do on the Sabbath. Women could not look into a jar or container on the Sabbath. Do you know why? Because they might find a white hair in the bottom of it and pluck it out and that would be work. You could not inspect your clothing on the day of the Sabbath because you might find a louse and kill it and that would be work. You were not allowed to bathe on the Sabbath Because water might drip from your body onto the floor and that might wash the floor that you're standing on. And that's work. You could not prepare uh, food. You could not come out and find grain, which we're going to see what Jesus and the disciples did. There was, uh, I got a whole list here. You could not beat wool. You could not dye wool. You could not spin. You could not weave. You could not make two loops. You could not tie a knot or untie a knot because it was work. You could not blow out a candle if it was lit. Or you could not light a candle if it wasn't lit because it was work. There was uh, other things like scraping hides. It was demolishing anything. Extinguishing a fire or flame. Uh putting finishing touches on an object, uh, transporting any object between a private domain and a public domain. You could only walk, as I brought up a couple weeks ago, 3,000 steps, but the Pharisees got around that. They made ways to where you could put food at the end of that 3,000 steps and actually have it be at 2,999. And as long as there was food there, you could pick up the food and you could walk more steps. They even started changing the laws that they had put in place. And this is why what happened was they ended up with 24 chapters. You couldn't lift certain things because it was work. This was a heavy burden. It was oppressive. And this is why Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28, verse 30, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, Jesus was speaking this to those that were oppressed by this Sabbath laws. Listen, I'm not going to take this away from us because I know this. How many of you know that when you're weary, Jesus comes alongside of you and makes you strong? How many of you know that it says in the Scripture that He'll carry your burdens? But this portion of Scripture, Jesus is saying this to His fellow Jewish brothers and sisters. He said, listen, come to Me who are weary and burdened with the law, and especially the Sabbath law. And how many of you know in Hebrews, it makes it very clear that Jesus is our Sabbath. He is our rest. But we see, and I want to start reading in Mark chapter 2, so go back there because we're going to see this portion of Scripture. And and you know what? Before I do this, I I need to point something out out to you. Uh, Turn to John chapter 5. As I was looking in the Harmony of the Gospels, and some of you know the Harmony of the Gospels, what they do is they put in order all four Gospels as things happened in a timeline. And what I want you to be aware of, and I believe that Pastor Terry taught this on a Wednesday night a couple weeks ago, is that we're going to look at Jesus' first encounters with the Pharisees and the Sabbath. We're going to run through this quick. But it's a story that we all know. It's about this man who was laying at this pool called Bethesda for 38 years. In fact, I might not even read through it. You can read through it later because I just don't have the time this morning. But here was this man who was at this pool of Bethesda. And again, we don't know in Scripture because Scripture doesn't tell us. But as I studied into it, uh, you come to find out that maybe this stirring of the water by an angel supposedly might have been just something that was a fictional thing. But Scripture tells us that there was an angel that would come and steer the water And whoever could get into that pool first would be healed. 
Okay, and what happens is this, is that Jesus shows up, and here's this man, and it is Sabbath. So it's between Friday at sunset and Saturday at sunset, and Jesus sees this man, and he has compassion on him. And he asks him what he's doing there, and I'm paraphrasing this. You can go back and read it. And this man responds to Jesus and tells him, I've been waiting for 38 years to be put into this pool, but by the time I get there, nobody helps me, and somebody else enters it. And see, what happens there is this, is that, again, Jesus shows compassion to this man. And he tells this man to take up his mat or his bed and walk. And he heals him. Now, I want you to think about the condition of this man. For 38 years, he'd been laying there. I don't know about you. If I lay in our bed more than six hours, my body gets sore. Some of you might not be able to relate with that, but I can't take more than five hours laying in a bed. And it's not our mattress, it's it's any bed. I just get sore after five hours. This man had been laying there for 38 years, Scripture says. Can you imagine the state that he's in? I I can't imagine it. But Jesus again shows compassion. He tells this man to take up his bed and walk. And you know what the problem was? Because the Pharisees... This is his first encounter with them. He does this on the Sabbath. And the only thing that we see Scripture mandate to the believers of that day was to cease from work. Jesus was not ever going to be under those 24 chapters or all those laws going in with the Sabbath that the Pharisees had instituted. And in this story of Bethesda, what we see is this, is that we see the Pharisees Uprise because Jesus is attacking something that they had set in place. That they laid down the law. And we see they get very upset. They say to the man, "Who? what are you doing carrying your bed? And the man pretty much tells them again, paraphrasing this, listen, someone that is mighty healed me, and if he has the ability and the authority to heal me, I'm going to take up my bed and my mat and I'm going to walk. I'm healed. He has miraculous powers. So keep that in mind. This is the first encounter with Jesus and the Pharisees. And what we're looking at here, Mark chapter 2, 23 through 28, is the second time that he encounters the Pharisees about the Sabbath. Their institution, the one that they had laid so many laws on. And it says this in verse 23, On the Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And some people might read that and say, Man, were these guys like stealing? No. Back in the Old Testament, and this is why it's important we read the Old Testament, God actually made a provision for Jews to be able to go to anybody's grain field. And if they were hungry, not for surplus, they could pick grain to eat. So that was a provision that God made so that people wouldn't go hungry. It was not to go in there and harvest, but it was just to collect enough to eat. So this is what the disciples are doing. They're plucking heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, Why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? So the Pharisees see this. And you know what I find comical here? And I actually heard, uh, it was uh, another preacher brought this out that I'd never heard before. The Pharisees must have been following Jesus. Jesus had walked up to this point, a proven fact, over 3,000 steps. And for the Pharisees to follow them, follow him and his disciples to be able to see what they were doing here, they had broken their own law. When we set up laws, a lot of times, I hate to say this, to domineer over people, parents, maybe you can relate. Kids, I don't want you to have nothing sweet after 7 o'clock at night. And 7.30, we're sitting in our chairs with a bowl of ice cream. And our kid comes up and says, hey, I thought we weren't supposed to have anything after 7 o'clock. How many of you know when we institute laws a lot of times, in an unjust manner, a lot of times we break them. 
This is where this saying came out. Do what I say, not what I do. Our hearts are prone to break laws. We don't like to be in the confines of laws, especially laws that we make of our own. But we see here, here that we're going through plucking heads of grain. I want to point out something here. They are breaking the laws of the Pharisees. That list that I read to you earlier, that was incorporated. Let me see here. Uh, 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 graining or uh, flushing seed, throwing seed, throwing flax. Um, um, my printer actually cut this off. Um, reaping. This is what they were doing, their actions. Here, they were actually uh, breaking about five of the Sabbath laws. Because for grain, I don't know if any of you have ever done this. I have done this just because I've related to the story. Once I was where there was wheat, and to be able to get the fruit out of, or the grain out of, the, the husk, you had to do some work. I guess I could relate it this way. For you that are looking forward to sweet corn, which I hope we get this year, What's one of the first things you do when you bring it home? You take the husk off, right? And then you have that hair, right, that you have to pluck off of it, and you put it in the pot and hopefully don't have to add a little sugar. In my grandmother's farm, me and my brother, when we used to go spend time there in the summertime, there was something that we did not look forward to, and it was shelling dried corn. And dried corn used to take the husk off, and we used to do this by hand, and you used to have to sit there and twist it. And those kernels would break off, and we'd do this in five-gallon buckets. And now I think about it, she probably just did it because, just to keep us busy. I'm sure she had a machine that somehow did that, but she kept us busy by doing it by hand. All these things would be breaking the Sabbath law if we were to do this on Saturday or Friday night to Saturday night. And this is what the disciples were doing. And so they questioned him, why are you doing this? This is not lawful on the Sabbath. And he said to them, to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and in, and hungry, and he was with with those who were with him? How he entered into the house of God in the time of Abathah, and the high priest ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any of the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not for man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Now there's two things here I need you to see that fired the Pharisees up here. The first one is when he would say, have you never read? Jesus, you'll notice in the gospel, says that phrase, and have you not heard? What he would do is he would go back to the Old Testament. And how many of you know that the Pharisees were those that studied the Old Testament? There was nothing in the Old Testament that they did not feel they did not know. So whenever Jesus said things like this, have you not read? I can imagine it got them very upset. It'd be like me saying to Paul, who cuts trees, who... For years have cut trees, and I've seen him cut wood, and I know he knows what he needs to do to not cause a, a tree to fall on a house. It would be like, hey, Paul, have you ever read the manual on how to cut trees after him doing it for 15 years? I would think he would be offended. Or going to Amy at her job at the hospital and saying, Amy, hey, I don't think you're quite doing your job right. Would you read this little manual I have for you? She'd probably on a bad day, throw it at me and say, get lost. She's a very kind person, but on a bad day, she might do that. It might be saying to Tim, hey, Tim, I think I know how to install garage doors just a little bit better. And I've never installed a garage door, or I attempted it once and almost got stabbed. So, so I would assume and, and I would think that this would get them riled up. And this is what it did to the Pharisees. It riled them up. They were teachers. They were the ones that knew everything. And then we see here what Jesus does is he brings them back to this story. And I don't have time to go through that story today with you, but I'm going to give you where it is. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 21. 
And again, I'm going to paraphrase this for you today so you get the grasp of what Jesus is saying to them. We see in 1 Samuel chapter 21, David was fleeing for Saul. This is when David's on the run. And we got to understand that Jesus, David is, is rightfully king. And he's on the run from Saul who's trying to take his life. And he has his men with him and they are famished. This part of scripture tells us. And he comes to this place called Nob, or I guess it's Nob. I'm not going to say noob. That just sounds weird. A mile, just a mile west from Jerusalem, where the tabernacle was. There's some of you here. I know Pastor Terry has taught a class on the tabernacle, so he's going to grasp what happens here. And I want the rest of you to understand what is happening here, why Jesus is bringing this to the Pharisees' attention. And we see David comes there, and he has no food. He's hungry. He meets the priest... Uh, uh, Ahimelech there. And the, and he asked the priest for something to eat. And at first the priest tells him, listen, I don't have anything to eat. And all David asked for is five loaves of bread for him and his men. And the priest tells him, listen, uh, there is no common bread here, normal bread, but I do have the holy bread. And we see in the story, the priest will ask David if his men have abstained from laying with women, fornicating with women. He actually asks, are your men holy? And David assures the priest that he is. And what happens is this, is this priest does something amazing. He gives them five loaves of the twelve that were presented to the Lord. This is an amazing story. Pastor Terry will tell you that there was 12 loaves of bread that were put out on a golden table in the tabernacle. Right, Pastor? I don't think I'm getting this wrong. That were presented before the Lord. And what it did is it symbolized what? God's relationship that he wanted to have with the children of Israel, the 12 tribes. Fellowship, because the breaking of bread was fellowship. So every Sabbath, what would happen is 12 fresh loaves were placed on this table, this golden table in the presence. They actually, they referred to it at times as the, the bread, the presence bread, because it was in the presence of God. But it was a symbol. It symbolizes God's desire to have fellowship with the 12 tribes. And we see what happens here is after the priest finds out that David's men have kept themselves, have been holy, what he does is he gives them the holy bread to eat. Now see, the Pharisees know this story. And what is amazing about this, the priest himself couldn't even eat that bread until after Sabbath was over. And then the priest and only the priest could eat that bread. That would already been 24 hours old. Only them. And we see what happens here is that this priest. Who must have been close to God. A priest who understood that no ritual or symbol trumps people or mercy or grace. And Jesus, what he's applying here in Mark 2 is he's saying, listen, don't you remember what David and his men did? Now go back to where he is first encounter, the man laying paralytic for 38 years. How crude the Pharisees were upset about that. Our laws aren't being followed. The true miracle was a man who couldn't walk for 38 years was healed. Legalism had had their clutch on the Pharisees to the point that they could not see the true miracle. And we see in this story that Jesus brings up to him and says, listen, nothing trumps a person, mercy or grace. Symbols are good. Tradition is good. But it should never trump mercy, grace, and people. 
And I believe what God wants to convey to us today is this. Even though David was the rightful king running for his life, should have never been in the position of begging or seeking bread. It was the same with Jesus Christ. Who came, who should have been accepted by the children of Israel. But we know through God's sovereign plan, which included us, the Gentiles, that Jesus walked it out. But if Jesus would have been accepted by the Jewish people of the day, he would have never been in a grain field plucking grain with his disciples and breaking their legalistic laws. I believe what God wants to speak to us today through this is this. We've got to make sure in our lives that we don't become legalistic. I've seen churches, I've been in churches where they had certain guidelines that you had to follow to be a Christian. You know where my guidelines are? Right here. The Bible makes it clear as pastors, elders of church, we are not to overlord any of you. Listen. If I have concern out of love, I'm going to come and speak to you. The Bible tells me that I need to do that. The Bible tells me that you need to do that also. This whole thing about we can't judge one another in a church is from the pit of hell. We are not to judge the world. The Bible says that God judges the world. Makes a big weight off my shoulders when the guy flips me off on the road today. (laughs) I don't need to judge him. God judges him. I don't need to look at the lifestyles of people out there and be judgmental because you know what? God judged them. God's called me to love them in every capacity. But in the household of faith, where we're supposed to prefer one another above ourselves, we are called to love one another and come to one another when we see our brother falling into sin. When we see them going wayward, out of love, we need to come and embrace them. Let them know that we're there for them. But don't ever allow yourself to be caught up in legalism. legalism. But on another note, I want to say this. What I'm seeing today in the church is God is not being lifted up as the holy God that he is. God is not your buddy. Hear what I'm saying right now. God is not your buddy. Do not refer to him that way. I'll be honest with you. I treat my buddies sometimes a whole lot different than I would treat God. Right, Bob? Right, Dan? We serve a holy God who has given us laws, who has given us Jesus Christ to show us a better way to live. Embrace that. That is life. Honor him for who he is. Do it every day. Remember that Jesus is your rest. Jesus is your Sabbath. He said to Matthew, whoever is heavy burden or heavy laden, come to me and I'll give you rest. How many of you need rest today? How many of you need to be set free from legalism of you're not good enough? Listen, you are never going to be good enough on your own standards or your own laws. You might have written a book of 24 chapters of putting you in a slot what you have to do to be good enough. You will never fit it because there's only one that is good and it is God Jesus said and he's good enough let's stand today if I could have a few prayer members off to the side if you need prayer for anything today please go see one of our prayer partners um 
be praying for Daryl Emenheiser. Daryl went into the hospital Friday, and he's actually being discharged today. Many of you might know this, but some of you don't know, but Daryl was diagnosed with Parkinson's about six months ago. And so he's been having medication introduced to his body, and uh, they just have to get that medication right. Uh, please continue to pray for my father. I appreciate the prayers. Uh, that was a shock, getting that news uh, about my dad having lung cancer. It is stage two. Uh, we find out everything Tuesday, whether it's went to his brain or to his liver. Um, but pray that it hasn't, because if it's just in his lung, it's very treatable. And um, and but my my father appreciates all your prayers, and he's in a good mindset. He he just says, God, whatever your will is, uh, let it be. And he believes in a sovereign God. So I want to thank you for those prayers. But right now, listen, let's just bow our heads. Don't allow yourself to be captivated captivated by legalism. But I need you to understand, too, that we serve a holy God. And we should not go before him in any light manner or, or approach. If Jesus Christ were to appear in this room right now, I would be convinced that most of us would fall on our knees or our faces. He's here. The God of the universe is here. The Holy Spirit resides in you. Somehow we fool ourselves in believing that they're in the background, but they are here. We pray every Sunday morning, Lord, show up. Because the Bible does tell us when his people gather, when they praise and lift up his name, he shows up in a special way. But God is present today. Don't allow yourself to be put under legalism. Be those that are discerning by the the spirit of God and by his word that was inspired. Let God do something new in you today. Father, we come to you today, and I thank you for your word, your living word, word that was breathed and is alive. And Father, I just thank you, Lord, for the insights into the Old Testament so we can understand what you were saying to the Pharisees. You were saying, listen, mercy and grace and people trump symbols they trump tradition ritual Father I thank you for that I thank you that you made a way that we would no longer have to be under a heavy burden we wouldn't have to be tired I'm thankful that you gave us Jesus Christ and it makes it clear in Hebrews that he is our rest he is our Sabbath and we thank you Lord, for rest, for the mercy that was given, the provision for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray right now, if there's anybody here that needs prayer, Lord, that they don't hold off going off to the side and receiving it. Praying with those who are righteous. You said that the prayers of a righteous man avail much. And God, our righteousness is in you. So God, we know that you hear our prayers. Cause us, Lord, to come to you boldly. Lord, we are living in a day that we have to depend on you to lead us, to guide us. So, Father, cause us, Lord, to be faithful. Cause us to be discerning. Cause us, Lord, to be those that are in your word daily and having fellowship with you every minute of our day. So, Father, I just thank you for everyone here, and I just ask, Lord, a blessing over them. And I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.